Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, truly one of the most unusual ever recorded, contains dribble, slang, and frank discussion of subject matter which under no circumstances should be heard by small children, persons with a heart condition, or anyone who is upset easily. If you are such a person, or if you are the parent of a very small child in the room, we urge you to switch off your streaming device now. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I can't top that. You can't. I can't. That's right. Just wanted to let you know that Patreon people, all the fine folks. Ding dong. Who's here? It's a new case for you early. (gasps) Early. Yay. For our Patreon peeps out there. We are putting together goodie bags for you today. Mm -hmm. Super excited about some of the stuff that you're getting because I too have it. Woohoo. And also, not VD, not funny, Jen. Also, we are coming up with some really good ideas now that I am out of school for the summer. We got lots of free time, Mm -hmm. spent all day yesterday writing, all day today recording and calling our new best friend from across the pond. Our friend Nico. Nico. He's the wonderful man behind the sound and editing and music of our True Crime Podcast. We would be lost without him. Yes, we would. So anyway, we, for Patreon, this episode is coming out early for you. Sorry that we totally missed the month of May. It was more hectic than we thought it was going to be, but But we're going to make it up for you. Yeah, promise. Promise. Lots of good stuff coming. So. You ready to hit it? Do it. A, it's your get. This it's, is a it's, doozy. It's your, your, tell your you. thing. Kansas City, Missouri. Hey, I know there. It was the summer of 1984, and a Mr. John Robinson advertised for a sales representative secretary for his company. Equi 2 was the name of his company. Equi? Equi. 19-year-old Paula Godfrey applied for the job and was thrilled to get the position. She was anxious to start her career with the hopes of it giving her the step up she needed. She was beyond thrilled when she told her parents all about her new job and even more excited that she would be traveling to San Antonio for training with her new boss. I love San Antonio. It's a great little town. On September 1st, 1984, John Robinson arrived at the Godfrey residence to pick up Paula for her San Antonio training trip. As she left the house, her smile was beaming, and she waved goodbye to her parents. Did her smile light up the room as she left? Godfrey's parents were expecting to hear from her often throughout the trip, but had yet to hear from her. Mm -hmm. Panic began to creep in, and with no contact from their daughter after four days, her father, Bill Godfrey, would fly to San Antonio to check on her. The panic soon turns to shock and fear as Mr. Godfrey discovered that Paula had never even checked into the hotel in which she was supposed to be staying, nor was she even ever booked at the hotel. You're kidding me. Mr. Godfrey returns home and immediately confronts Robinson at his office and demanded that his daughter contact him within three days. After two days, a handwritten letter appeared with a Kansas postmark on it. The letter was supposedly written by Paula and it stated that she was safe. Her father could sense something was wrong, and the letter did not sound like how his daughter would speak or write. Godfrey took the letter directly to the police department. Soon, a second handwritten letter would be posted to the Overland Park Police Department, again reportedly written by Paula. This letter, again, was postmarked in Kansas and stated that she was okay, also thanking John Robinson for all his help, Mm. stating that she did not want to see her family again. Yeah, that doesn't sound like Paula. Again, Paula's parents knew the letter was fake. However, the police took the letter as genuine Mm. and removed Paula from the list of missing person cases that they had open. 
The day Paula left the house beaming with excitement to start her first real job would be the last day her parents would ever see her. Sixteen years later, a knock upon a Kansas door would unleash a secret horror story that only Stephen King could create. At 10.15 a.m. on Friday, June 2nd, 2000, in a quiet neighborhood in the Santa Barbara Estates in Kansas, two police officers knocked on the door of John Robinson and told him he was under arrest. While authorities were confident in their case, it was only the beginning. John Edward Robinson was born in the Chicago suburb of Cicero on December 27, 1943. He was born the third of five children to his parents, Henry and Alberta. His father, Henry, was a severe alcoholic, while Alberta was known to be hmm, rather cruel with punishing the children when they Mm. needed it. At 12 years old, encouraged by his father, he joined the Boy Scouts. By 1957, he had become an Eagle Scout, Mm. which is a huge honor. Right. He was chosen as the sole American representative to lead 120 Boy Scouts at the Royal Command Performance in London in front of Queen Elizabeth II. Wow. It was later in 1957 that Robinson would enroll at Quigley Preparatory Seminary, located in Chicago, and it was a boys' school for aspiring priests. But he dropped out after one year due to disciplinary issues. In 1961, he enrolled at Morton Junior College in Cicero with the hopes of becoming a medical x-ray technician, but dropped out after two years. In 1964, at age 21, he moved to Kansas City, Missouri, after being accused of embezzling money from the hospital in which he worked. He then got married and went on to have a baby named John Jr. in 1964, followed by fraternal twins in 1971, Christopher and Christine. So here comes 1969 and the beginning of this long, sordid tale. Lots of dates, lots of names, lots of moving around. Robinson would be arrested for the first time after he was caught embezzling $33,000 from a Dr. Wallace Graham. Robinson was working for Graham as an x-ray tech. And here I bet you're thinking, hey, he didn't have a degree. Thank you. Yeah. Didn't he quit school? Um, Yes, you're correct. He obtained this job using fake credentials. No way. He was convicted and was sentenced to three years probation. Ah, yeah. 1970, Robinson violated probation, deciding to move back to Chi-Town, Chicago. But mm, he forgot to ask his probation officer. Oh, that's a problem. If he could. Oh, and as a matter of fact, he didn't even bother to tell him. Mm, mm -hmm. He just picked up and moved. In Chicago, he took a job as an insurance salesman at R.B. Jones Company. In 1971, itchy fingers hit again and he embezzled firm funds. So he's white collar for now. Yes. White collar crime. He was arrested once again. The court made him move back to Kansas City and they extended his previous probation. Just probation. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that's that's should go to jail for that little while. Upon moving back to Kansas City, he worked hard to improve his image. Sure he did. Being a family man helped him out, but he also became a scout leader baseball coach, and even a Sunday school teacher. Hope nobody at the church trusted him with money. Oh, wait. Oh, no. But um bum In 1977, he was able to talk himself up and onto the board of directors of a local charitable organization where he forged a series of letters. These letters were from the organization's executive director to the mayor of Kansas City, as well as to other civic leaders, where the letters commended him on his generosity, his volunteer efforts, as well as what a great guy he was and how he should be recognized. His letter campaign reached a new high when he had himself named the charity organization's Man of the Year and even threw himself a party where people would come to celebrate him and how great he was. He's a go-getter, isn't he? He was even able to trick the state senator, Mary (laughs) Gant, into presenting him with the plaque. And the Kansas City Star was even going to run a story on this great man and his amazing award. However, the paper received numerous protests about the false story resulting in a reporter, Mac Edwards, being sent to investigate the claims. Wow. Embarrassed, the Kansas City Star ran another story exposing Robinson's criminal history 
and his guilt in the embezzlement charges. That's not the only, yeah. Can you imagine, like, you just, I'm going to be man of the year, and I'm going to invite all these city officials to come, and it's going to be great. Yeah. Seriously? Uh You know, the Kansas City Star was also in trouble before, too, you know? They ran a thing about clowns, and the picture that they used was John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. With probation finally completed in 1979, you'd think he'd stay on the straight and narrow. No. No. However, 1980 brought about another slew of charges, including embezzlement and check forgery. He's another man that wants to reach his potential but doesn't want to work for it. That's true. That is that's exactly yeah. right. It seems Robinson thought, hey, if I can't steal from others, I'm going to create my own company to steal from. <laughs> Robinson started a fraudulent hydroponics company mm-hmm. where he was able to swindle a friend out of $25,000. Mm. The man had willingly invested it with him with little questions asked because he needed a fast return on his money to pay for his dying wife's medical bills. Now, was this hydroponic dealing with uh, marijuana? I think it was just like a plant growth thing. Like, right. You know, okay. December 30th, 1980. Robinson was fired from yet another job. Hmm. Employee relation manager at Guy's Foods in Liberty, Missouri. In June the following year, Robinson was charged with felony theft. He was eventually ordered to pay back $50,000 to Guy's Foods. December 31st, Robinson pleaded guilty to stealing a check worth $6,000, and now he faced seven years in jail. Robinson made a deal with the prosecutor and received 60 days in jail with five Mm. years probation. Wow, he's a charmer. His jail time was served from May 8th, 1982, before being released in July. Now, see, I was going to say, how in the hell would his wife still stay with him after all that? She does. But I'm all the way through. But he's a charmer. So. I'm sure he told her that it's somebody else's fault and... Crazy, right? Unreal. It was around this time that Robinson started to pick up a little hobby. Mm -hmm. He joined a club very much unlike the Boy Scouts, where he would find like-minded folks who liked what he did. You know, small gatherings where they would enjoy chips, dips, chains, Chains, whips. whips. Club might be the wrong word here. Robinson joined the International Council of Masters which was a secret sadomasochism cult. Awesome. The members called themselves Slave Master, and part of the membership requirements was to lure victims to these gatherings where they would be tortured and or raped. Oh. While John Robinson seemed to be a bit deceiving, he wasn't all bad. Robinson founded a charity named Kansas City Outreach Program that provided housing and jobs for young women who had babies and perhaps were a bit down on their luck. He had started some charities in and around town that would help these young women out, as well as help coordinate adoption of the babies from the center, giving both the baby and the young mother a shot at a better life. His good standing in the community allowed him to have some contacts at the area hospitals as well. In fact, in 1985, Robinson's brother and his wife had been trying desperately to have a baby and were having trouble conceiving. They were heartbroken and becoming distraught. With Robinson's connections and $5,000, Robinson was able to give the couple all that they dreamed of when he helped them adopt a baby from the outreach program. One of these women that benefited from the outreach was 19-year-old Lisa Stacy, a new mother with a four-month-old named Tiffany. Stacy lived in a poorer area of Kansas City, and she was separated from her husband. Lisa had met a man named Carl and had gotten pregnant, and they got married, but the marriage fell apart only a few months later. Stacy was a client of the Truman Medical Center and staff at the center took Stacy to Robinson with the hopes of getting her into a better situation. On January 9th, John Robinson picked up Stacy and her baby from her in-laws and moved them into a nearby hotel in a much better part of Kansas City. It was later that same night that Lisa would make an ominous phone call to her mother-in-law. Lisa, crying and hysterical, is telling her mother-in-law that these people are telling her that her mother-in-law was going to take the baby away from her. The mother-in-law tried to assure Lisa that they would never dream of doing that. And Lisa then says something at that time that made no sense. Lisa informs her that she was forced to sign four blank pieces of paper. The mother-in-law, not sure what to make of it, tells Lisa to absolutely not sign anything and that she was not involved in any such plan. Right then, Lisa states, they're coming, and she hangs up the phone. That's scary. 
Worried, Lisa's sister-in-law called the hotel staff to check on Lisa and the baby. The relative was informed that Lisa and the baby had checked out of the hotel. Mm. Since this was not like Lisa and was not the plan that was originally set up, the relative went to police to file a missing persons report. Police were not very concerned at first since Lisa is an adult and perhaps she just wanted to disappear, as Mm -hmm. sometimes happens. happens. Another phone call would come in just a short time after that. And this time it was from a Father Martin claiming to be from a mission in downtown Kansas City. Father Martin said he had just seen Lisa and Tiffany and that they were just fine. But they had decided to leave town with a man named Bill. The family immediately calls the mission, who then informed them there is no one that works at the mission by the name of Father Martin. A few days later, a letter arrived to Lisa's mother-in-law, seemingly from Lisa herself. In the typed letter, Lisa stated that she wanted to try to make it out on her own, and she took off to do it. She had stated that she had been having a rough time and wanted to give her baby a better life. The letter was signed by Lisa, and the signature was, in fact, hers. The police start questioning all those around her, including her ex-husband, Carl. Carl denied having seen Lisa recently, and the police believed him. The police then interview John Robinson, who informed them that Lisa had told him that she had met a guy named Bill, and that the three of them were going to set off and start a new life together. Hmm. Having heard the name Bill before, the police are starting to think maybe it was just a case of, you know, star-crossed lovers taking off and wanting to build a new life. After just a few weeks, police stopped looking for Lisa and the baby, since there was no evidence of a crime. Right. December 18th, 1984. While the police may have stopped looking into the disappearance of Lisa, a social worker named Ann Smith, who referred women to Robinson's organization that places the young moms into homes and jobs, Mm -hmm. decides to check his references. Robinson claimed to be affiliated with the bank. So the social worker calls the bank and, shocker, they've never heard of Robinson. No way. Shut up. Right? Who didn't see that coming? While that was a bit of a surprise, the bigger surprise was about to come. They informed the social worker that Robinson had done time and was still on probation. Hmm. Smith passed the information on to the probation office. Robinson's record indicated he had had a felony conviction from a few years prior, an embezzlement charge from Mobile Oil, where he had worked earlier. He stole from everyone. Obviously, yeah. While it is apparent that Robinson is a con man, a white-collar criminal, but what is the angle? What's he doing with his own organization? What's in it for him? The probation office calls Robinson in for an interview to see what they could find out. Robinson informs them that he's just a business guy who's trying to give back to the community. Aw, what a nice guy. He doesn't want anything from them. Just your cash. Now, the office dives into his finances, assuming that he is funneling money out of somewhere, some way. Robinson claims that he is not doing anything wrong and everyone else is just misunderstanding it all. Of course they are. He's an angel. With nothing concrete to hold him. Robinson gets to walk. Missouri probation officer Stephen Himes refuses to give up and continues to keep digging into Robinson. He knows that while you're on probation, you can be sent back to jail if you don't follow the rules. Well, maybe he hasn't in the past. It takes two and a half years, but Robinson finally messes up. As a parolee, you cannot own or have a firearm. Correct. Guess what Robinson has? Um, A firearm. That would be correct. Ding, ding, ding. With the violation of his probation, he is sent to prison, finally, for seven years. Good. Does he serve the whole term? June 1997. A man calls the Overland Police Department and states that he is trying to find his stepsister, whom he had not heard from in weeks. Mm -hmm. Her name is Kathy Clampett, 27 years old, from Texas, who had moved to Kansas City just recently for a job and a better life. Kathy had answered an ad in a newspaper looking for a secretary who would work for a busy CEO named John Dawson. A short time after beginning work, Kathy quit showing up to work. Kathy's mom in Texas receives a typed letter, but immediately the wording is off and Kathy's mom is suspicious. Kathy's stepbrother calls the company and asks to speak to John Dawson. Never heard of him. The voice on the other end of the line informs him that no one by that name works there. Her brother travels to her place to go through the belongings and see if there's anything that he can find there. While he's there, he finds a receipt for a hotel with Kathy's name on it 
as well as the name John Robinson. Her stepbrother goes to the company location and finds that it has been shut down and its owner, John Robinson, which Kathy was told John Dawson, Mm -hmm. was just now beginning his prison sentence that he would be serving. Robinson had been arrested weeks earlier for fraud and theft. While it appears at this point in time that Robinson was just a white-collar criminal, the three missing women's cases had been assigned to different detectives, meaning that no one had put the similarities of the case together. And remember, this 1980s, no computers. Detectives would have to write stuff down by hand. Mm -hmm. And so there was no general place to plug in the name John Robinson. Right. You couldn't so search is it, it. So there were different detectives in different areas, right? right. And they never got together to All share information. All connected to this person. Like most people of his kind, Robinson is a standout in prison. Of course a he is. A rule follower and well-liked by all the guards, as well as the prison doctor named William Bonner. And why is that? Because they change their personality on who they need to be. Ding, 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 ding. Just like who? Hmm. Every single one we've ever done, but yeah. in particular, Dennis Bullock. He also got to know the prison's librarian, Beverly, who just happened to be Dr. Bonner's wife. Now, Beverly and Robinson, you know, they start talking and she gives him a job in the prison library, which causes them to spend a lot of time together, which leads to blowjobs. Wink, wink, wink. But it also leads to a plan. Nudge, nudge. Know what I mean? Know what I mean? Beverly and John Robinson make a plan to be together after he is released from prison. Dr. Bonner is shocked by all of this, but he decides, can't do anything about it. He grants her a divorce. And he also, part of the divorce agreement is that he would be paying Beverly $1,000 a month alimony. Uh, that's not really a lot of money for a doctor. 1980, was it prison doctor? I guess they make some. I don't know. Yeah, I guess mm. I don't know. Okay. In the spring of 1993, Robinson is released from prison and Beverly moves to Kansas to be with them. A year passes and no one hears from Beverly. Beverly, huh? until a holiday letter arrives and is postmarked from Europe. The letter goes on to tell all the relatives about all the fabulous travel she is having while she's in Europe. I'm sure. No one really thinks much about it, and, you know, they believe Beverly to be fine. After all, she signed her letter, Bev, which was the only handwritten part of the letter, by the hmm. way. January 1994. Barb Sandry age 47, is living in England, and she received a letter from her very first boyfriend. No. Barb was just 16 when she met a handsome, charismatic 18-year-old named John Robinson. Barb was intrigued, excited, and flattered, so she wrote back. Just a week later, the letter started flying in. Hmm. And of course, the letter soon turned to love letters. Sexual letters or love? Well, they're 47, so I don't know. The couple begins to meet up randomly in various locations. Barb works as a translator in Europe, so she travels a lot for her job, which, of course, makes the meetups easy or easier, like you. John was quiet at first about what he did for his livelihood, but slowly he began to open up about his job. Mm -hmm. After all, one needs to be discreet when one works for the CIA. Oh, he got a job at the CIA. You know, he's not at liberty to discuss uh, much. God, I hope he stays safe. That's a dangerous job. Not much time passes when Robinson tells Barb he needs her to do him a favor and she has to be top secret about it. Robinson wants to send her a stack of envelopes and then she is to put postage on them Mm -hmm. from various places around Europe Mm -hmm. and then send them back over. Oh, and by the way, don't read them. Don't look at them. Just postmark them for me. Oh, I would so be opening Thank those you. letters. So would I steam those suckers up in the minute I got them. Steam them and just open them. Barb complies and does this for a little bit over a year. No way. All this time, Robinson is still living with his wife. The Robinson children had now grown up. John and his wife continued to live their best life together. They're still pillars in the community, volunteering when it's needed being the best grandparents to the grandchildren. From the outside, they look like an idyllic family. But that hobby that John discovered a little little mm-hmm. bit ago, going to start to rear up its ugly head because this new fangled device called the internet comes out. And you know, you can get on there and you can meet people from everywhere. You and can? those people are interested in the same things you are. Oh, really? Or so they say. 
Hmm. Are we talking about the uh, bondage? Let's just say his handle on these sites that he discovered Mm -hmm. was slave master. Slave master for cash. Robinson begins to go online looking for women, often young women, to entice them into his playpen. He was a father and a grandfather, Uh, as well as a sadomasochistic slave master. Son of a bitch. While his wife was at work, he would post pictures of himself online looking for women who were interested in meeting up for a little BDSM. One of these ladies he would meet is a 27-year-old named Suzette Troughton. Troughton lived in Michigan, but once she met Robinson, the two found out they had a lot in common, such as whips, chains, nipple clamps, fur handcuffs, you know, the normal stuff. Yeah. While all this was taking place, Barb, you know, she's still over in jolly old England, still thinks that she and Robinson are a couple. She thinks they're going to be together. Oh. Barb was kind of getting tired of the long distance thing and told Robinson, you know, I think I want more. I think I want to see you more. And Robinson says, you know what? You should move closer to me because, you know, with my job, since it's top secret and I'm out of town a lot mm-hmm. and I'm not around, at least you being nearby me, I'd be able to see you a little bit oh, more. I thought he was going to say, I'm sorry, I'm dying of cancer. No, not yet. Barb jumps in with both feet and moves from England to a duplex in Kansas City. Suzette Troughton age 27, is excited to start her brand new job. Which isn't really there. That a man named John Robinson has set up for her. She would be taking care of Robinson's elderly father while he was cruising around the world. (laughs) With the CIA. Thank you. She packed all that she owned along with her greatest possessions, her two beloved Pekingese dogs, Pika and Harry. The dogs were her babies, Mm -hmm. and the three were never apart. For her first night in town, Robinson checks her into a hotel, but the hotel would not take dogs. Suzette is not happy about Mm -hmm. this, but Robinson assures her he knows the perfect place that will kennel the dogs and treat them even better than she does. After Mm. all, Suzette must comply with her slave master at all times, just as the signature on the slave contract states. Did she not read the contract? You see, Robinson and Suzette met online in a BDSM chat room. Mm. Both had agreed to partner up and Suzette would be his slave and he would be her slave master. So that was the job. Robinson would give her a job as well as a position of slave. Lots of positions in that job. (coughs) Suzette and her mother had always been very close and they would email and call each other often. So on March 1st, 2000, when the communication with Suzette abruptly stopped, her mother became frightened. Her mom could sense something was not right, so she called the police department. With her urging, the police decided to look into this man named John Robinson. After all, police had heard this man's name come up in the past in regards to other missing women. The police start from the day that Suzette was last heard from. They want to find out what John Robinson was doing on that very day. Authorities are quick to uncover two bank transactions on that day a hotel bill, and a dog kennel bill. Police call the kennel and learn that Robinson went and picked up the dogs, so they are hopeful that if they can track down the dogs, the dogs will be with Suzette. Police start calling around to all the animal shelters trying to locate the dogs. Family had previously told police that Suzette would never part with those dogs, Mm -mm. and if the dogs were located and Suzette was not with them, it meant that something sinister had happened to Suzette. Meanwhile, Suzette's mom, Carolyn, is calling John Robinson, demanding some answers to where her daughter is and what happened to her. Even if the sailboat that they were supposedly cruising on, Mm -hmm. once in a while it would have to come ashore, right? Right, you would think. And they know that, and she's not hearing anything from her. John Robinson tells her, don't worry, they're probably just sightseeing. Oh, yeah. And you'll hear from her soon. Mm -hmm. Police know something here is not right, but they need to be careful. They can't let Robinson know that they're starting to suspect him of things. Police were pulling out all the big guns, retired detectives, and even the FBI. Authorities are now wondering if Robinson was involved in a sex trafficking organization. That would make sense. Police decide a good way inside would be to tap these phone calls between Carolyn, Suzette's mother, and Robinson. Like usual, he's not saying much, while at the same time he's being his usual cheeseball self. Carolyn informs John that she received a package containing a Hawaiian doll. 
and it had no return address on it. And he says, see, they're just fine. The phone call does not seem to reveal much at first. Right. Police then learned that Robinson's father had passed away years before. Oh. And this was the gentleman Suzette was supposed to be cruising around the world with and taking you care of. You mean John Robinson lied? I think he did. Oh, my goodness. Shortly after, a letter arrives to Carolyn's home. The letter was signed by Suzette, but something was off. Her mother knew her daughter pretty well, and she knew that the wording of the letter was not the way Suzette would write it. It may have been signed by her, but it was not her. Police are now growing more concerned and learning more about John Robinson and his past. They start surveilling him at all times. They want to know what he's doing, where he's going, what's going on. It is apparent that Robinson is leading two lives. At home, he's a loving husband, father, and grandfather. During the day, when his wife is at work, he's hanging out in seedy areas with strippers and prostitutes. <laughs> He'd even followed them to various hotels in which he would agree to meet up with women. Hey, retired life. Yeah. Hashtag. The fear grows worse when the police learn that Robinson has lured yet another young woman into town with the promise of some BDSM play. Robinson even puts her up in the same hotel that he puts Suzette in. This time, police are prepared, and they rent the room right next door so that they can listen in. Now, what the police didn't quite figure in is that with this type of play, while consensual, sounds, uh, shall we say, violent and painful, smacks, whip cracks, pleading, it's all part of the play. So how would the police know if what John Robinson is doing, consensual, and agreed upon, or is it something more deadly? The police have to wait for now. Shortly after the liaison in the hotel room with the police listening in, the police learned that Barb and Robinson were planning to run off to Canada together. After all, since Robinson had just retired from the CIA, Aww. he was free to go wherever he wanted. The plan was that Barb would go, and just within a few weeks after he wrapped everything up, you know, tied up all the loose ends from mm -hmm. his retirement, he would meet her in Toronto. I bet you they had a huge retirement party for probably, him. It was almost like he wasn't there. Barb left early that morning and made it to St. Louis, where she contacted Robinson. He was very upset with her as she left too early and she was not supposed to leave until closer till noon. June 2nd, 2000. A break comes into police. A woman named Brenda came to the police station to state that her friend named John Robinson had met her at a hotel and they ended up getting into an argument. John Robinson had hit her a bit too hard and she wanted to file charges against him. But that's not all. Robinson had stolen all of her sex toys that she had brought with her to <gasps> the meeting. Not the sex toys. And well, those are expensive. Hey. But honestly, who's going to use them again? Really? Like, why would you steal this? It's disgusting. You know. Who's going to use them? You can wash them. Put them in the dishwasher. No, it's disgusting. Nope. Hey, I've seen them at estate I, sales. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> right where they were left with the lube. Police go to the Robinson home to make an arrest in the theft of the buzzing toys as well as the assault. Robinson comes to the door and fakes shock as to whatever could be the issue. Hmm. The police take him in, but they also confiscate his computers. The search warrant gave police the right to search his house, but also the chance to ask about his 17 plus other identities. Oh, and of course, the whereabouts of Lisa and Tiffany Stacy, Paula Godfrey, <laughs> Kathy Clampett, and Suzette Troughton. The warrant also allows a search of a few of the storage units he had had in and around the Kansas City area, as well as a nearby farm that he would use for fishing and camping occasionally. Ugh. John Robinson's first storage unit is located in Olathe, Kansas. Police locate a ton of evidence. They retrieve social security cards, driver's license, birth certificates, and other things that belong to all of the missing women. The farm located in Lynn County was large but rather junky with a trailer on site. Trash barrels, outbuildings, and derelict vehicles were located all across the property. It took a bit of searching, but soon investigators zoom in on a shed. Next to the shed were two big yellow barrels. They roll out the first one uh, in an attempt to get a better look inside, mm, as well as let the canine nope, units nope, get in. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, thank you. As they were moving it, the first one, it fell over. A policeman on site bent over and attempted to get it right side up. And while he was doing so, he noticed a streak of 
a dark uh, rust color no, no. that rolled down the side of the barrel. Now, it could have been anything be stored in that container. Yeah, but I'm sure Grease, the smell oil, will tell you. Putrid water. And who only knows how long it's been out there. But as the officer's looking at the barrel and kind of mulling it over, he notices a fly landed exactly on no. that red streak. It was a blowfly. No. Oh, that's disgusting. Oh, it gets worse. Oh, I'm sure. When they opened the lid, the smell was immediate, and there was no mistaking what it was. A human body. The body had been folded in half with the back hunched up toward the top. The body turned out to be Suzette Troughton. Oh, poor Suzette. There was another yellow barrel next to this one, and they feared this one, too, held human remains. I bet you it does. They removed the lid, and their fears were realized. A second decomposing body was in the barrel, but it was not one of any of the missing women. Police are now thinking, who the heck is this? Autopsy results came back shortly thereafter and revealed that both of the victims in these two barrels had had their skulls bashed in with a blunt object, which they determined to be a hammer. Uh. Also determined was that the women were struck in the back of the head with no defensive wounds, suggesting they didn't know it was coming. Surprise attack. So they were asleep or looking the other way. Right. They were surprised. June 5th, 2000. Authorities go to the other storage locker located in Raymore, Missouri. Police get into the locker, and it's stocked. The front of it's stocked with a variety of things one would put in there. Old tables, chairs, luggage set, whatever. Piece by piece, they're removing things in the front of the locker. They're kind of wondering, you know, maybe that was it. I'm sure they were hoping that was it. Right. I would hope so. But as they get closer to the back of the locker, a familiar smell begins to uh, seep in. Yeah, you it don't was forget that smell. The unmistakable odor of decaying flesh. Located in the very back against the wall are three barrels, all covered in plastic. They pry open the first barrel and find a body that has been in there for some time. Moving on to the second barrel, they look down and they notice that under the barrels, there was kitty litter that was placed. Mm, for the smell. Hoping that it would absorb the smell. Not, no kitty litter. There's not there enough kitty litter to do that. Nope. With each of these three barrels came a body. Would police now know what happened to Lisa Stacy, Paula Godfrey, and Kathy Clampett? I would hope so. On June 12th, the county pathologist determined the second body to be that of 21-year-old Polish immigrant Isabella Lawicki. Lawicki had never been reported missing from her family because her family had stated that she was traveling all over Europe. In fact, they had been receiving letters from her from all over, from Ugh. various locations throughout Europe. It seems that in 1999, John Robinson offered this young 21-year-old Polish immigrant who was living at that time in Indiana a job Oh. as well as a bondage relationship. Oh. She moved to Kansas City, and Robinson gave her an engagement ring. Now, mind you, he was still married at that time. He <sighs> even brought her in and paid for a marriage license, but the marriage license was never picked up. It's unclear whether Lewicka believed she and Robinson were married. She told her parents she had gotten married, but never told them her husband's name. She did sign a 115-item slave Jeez. contract that gave Robinson almost total control over every aspect of her life. Now, is a slave contract normal? Including her bank accounts. Uh, During huh. the summer of 1999, she disappeared. Robinson told a web designer that worked for him that Robinson had caught her smoking weed, and he immediately deported her. Within two weeks after the Raymore locker storage search, police now have the autopsy results back on the three bodies that were found in the barrels. And it's a shock. None of the bodies recovered matched Lisa, Stacy, Paula Godford, or Kathy Clampett. Really? These remains belong to three other women. Jeez. Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and her disabled daughter named Debbie, who was only 15 years oh. old. All three were killed by blunt force trauma. Even stranger, there was not one single missing persons report filed on any of these women. Really? As I stated, one of the bodies was determined to be that of Beverly Bonner. Now, you remember, she's mm -hmm. the prison's librarian. Right, who went vacationing in mm -hmm. Europe, so everything's fine there. 
Robinson, who had seduced her when he was incarcerated and then continued their lovely little affair after he was released, what else was determined about this was those alimony checks that her former ex-husband, Dr. Bonner, had been sending her had been cashed every single month for the past two years. And we know ghosts don't use cash, only credit. Mm-hmm. But um, bump. A letter with her signature was also found. It was a copy of the Christmas letter that was sent to her relatives over that holiday season when she disappeared. The family suspected something was amiss, but since they received a letter from her and she appeared to be cashing those checks, there was little that right. they could do. Sheila Faith would turn out to be John Robinson's first victim that he lured into his trap from the internet. Sheila Faith, age 45, had a 15-year-old daughter named Debbie, and Debbie was confined to a wheelchair Mm. due to spina bifida. He portrayed himself as a wealthy man who would support them, pay for Debbie's therapy, give Sheila a job. In 1994, they moved from Fullerton, California, to Kansas City and immediately disappeared. Robinson cashed Faith's disability and pension checks for the next seven years. Oh, my word. Investigators are sure that the missing woman had all met the same demise and by the hand of John Robinson. Investigators are now able to tie him to the deaths of eight women. Police find several letters made out to five different women's families, along Mm. with those envelopes postmarked from Europe. Authorities are now able to ascertain that Robinson, prior to killing them, would have them sign a few sheets of stationery. After he killed them, he would type a letter to loved ones, seemingly from their daughter or family member. I don't know. If I would get a typed letter, I think that would be odd. Especially back then. Because like right now, typed on a computer and you'd email them. But yeah. Right. But to receive one and then signature, unless it's like a, that's just weird. June 7th, 2000. Now remember Barb from mm-hmm. Europe? She's now in Toronto, and she's waiting for Robinson to join her, as they had planned. She has no idea that John Robinson was arrested and now is a suspected serial killer. Police call her to ask if she had heard anything about the arrest, and she's shocked to hear it, and that John Robinson was going to be with her to build a life. The man then tells her they believe she would have been his last victim had she not left early that day. He wanted her to wait till 11, remember? I said, remember that? And she left early. She wanted to get a head start because they found an empty barrel that was waiting for her. had her name on it. Not literally, but. Yep. Wow. Good for her for not waiting around. September 16th, 2002. John Robinson pleads not guilty to killing three women in a Kansas City courtroom. And 32 days later, a jury finds him guilty of capital murder. He was sentenced to death in Kansas for the murders of Troughton and the Polish immigrant Lewicka and life imprisonment for killing Stacy because she had been murdered before Kansas reinstated the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So there was a little situation with this case. John Robinson had faced a complex legal dilemma in Missouri where prosecutors were actively pursuing additional murder charges based on the evidence that they discovered. Robinson's attorneys opposed his extradition because Missouri is far more aggressive in capital punishment than, say, Kansas, which has yet to execute anyone since reinstating its death penalty. However, Chris Coster, Mm -hmm. remember him? I do. The Missouri prosecutor insisted as a condition of any plea bargain that John Robinson would have to lead authorities to the bodies of Lisa Stacy, Paula Godfrey, and Kathy Clampett. Since doing so would then constitute an admission of guilt, then that could be used against him in Kansas. So then Robinson refused. Coster, on the other hand, faced pressure to make the deal because that's what politicians do. Right. You know, The case was good, it was solid, but it wasn't airtight. When it became clear that the women's remains would never be found without Robinson's cooperation, a compromise of sorts was reached. In a carefully scripted plea in October 2003, John Robinson acknowledged only that the state had enough evidence to convict him of capital murder for the deaths of Godfrey, Clampett, Bonner, and the Faith. Though his statement was technically a guilty plea and was accepted as such by the Missouri court, it was notably devoid of any contrition or specific acceptance of responsibility. Those are some big $3 words there. Thank you. So John Robinson currently remains on death row in Kansas. Wow. 
Here's a little aftermath for you. In 2005, his wife filed for divorce ah, after finally. 41 years Jesus. of marriage, citing incompatibility. Really? And irreconcilable differences. Yeah, you think? I would have probably found other things to divorce him from <sighs> a right. while back. So investigators, thinking that they have the case shut, mm -hmm. there's still a few little questions that remain, or big questions. The case turned into a twisted, tangled web of greed and deceit. But the biggest shock was about to be revealed, leaving even the most jaded investigators with their mouths wide open. One day while interviewing his wife, the wife presented the police officer with a photo of a baby that John Robinson's brother had adopted through John. Mm -hmm. That baby girl was none other than Lisa Stacy's baby daughter, Tiffany. He drew up she was fake alive. adoption papers, collected $5,000 from his brother, presented that baby to the couple who were so desperate to have that baby. Mm. This was right after he had murdered Lisa Stacy. Lisa Stacy's daughter in 2006 who now goes by a different name, filed a civil suit against Truman Medical Center in Kansas City and the social worker, Karen Gaddis, contending that Gaddis told John Robinson about Stacy and her newborn daughter in 1984 after he told her he was looking for women for his fictional home, unwed mothers of white babies. And that's in quotes. In 2007, the person formerly known as Tiffany Robinson, and the hospital reached a settlement for an undisclosed sum. So did the family still The baby girl him? would not learn of all of this until mm -hmm. she was 17 years old. Could you imagine? Nope. So this is what I was thinking, too. You know how killers keep trophies. Mm -hmm. But to have that baby girl adopted by your brother and oh, you're you seeing that every Christmas, all the time and as a baby that girl is growing up mm -hmm. and looking the like ultimate. her mom... He was messed up. That's unreal. And he's not even good looking either. Not that well, matters, but it's it's all about charisma. Remember, crazy. look at like Bill Clinton. That Bill's gonna cute though. All right, Jen. That's all I got for you. I liked it. Like I said, there was a lot of going back and forth, and he had just to keep it easier to understand. I tried to get rid of most of the aliases because almost with every single woman, he had a different alias. Yeah, he would have to. And so. He had 17 plus yeah. that they know of, right? It's amazing. And then his handles on the... So I tried to, like, I revert back to just using his real name because I didn't want it to get... There's already a lot of names going on in there, you know what yeah. I mean? John with, Dawson, John now, Robinson, James... Did Scott I miss Dawson. it or did he show them where the bodies of... Them? No. He never did? Nope. They haven't been discovered. Uh, and he's never... Mm -mm. Then he just fry him. Let's just fry him now. Let's go down there, Camille. Let's just go down there and we'll put on our little... Uh, Executioner's masks. Butchers or a Dexter outfit. Kansas, do they do? Uh, no, that was the whole thing. The gas. Oh, I don't or know. Do, or not gas. That was injection the problem with or. The, uh, um, the case, because if he admitted that, then he would get, he would admit to it and they'd be able to use that against him over there. Okay, that's it. Unreal. That's all I got. Unreal story. I'm glad they caught him. I feel sorry for the victim's look families. Look years, years. I know. And you have to wonder and if he, there's he led a life. He got married and had kids and had grandkids and. Celebrations and those kids and have to live with what? It's terrible. His and she almost stayed married to him for forty-one maybe. years. Oh my God, yeah, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yes. Like, what did she not know the entire time? I guess was he able to keep that from her? He had his hands and everything. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but you would wonder. He was man after of the while. year, Jen. Oh, I know. But you would think after a while, with him not really, he'd have to fake a job all the time. He would have to fake. Well, he'd just open his own company. But really, <sighs> his job was find, luring women. Exactly. All right, that's all I got. You, got it. Right. you want to tell good people where they can find us? We are at Twitter. We are on our true crime podcast dot com. We're our own little blogger. It is up to date as of today. So tomorrow it will not be up to date. <laughs> crime Con in two weekends. Oh my gosh. So if you are going to Crime Con. It's a week from today, we leave. Yeah, a week from today, we leave. But if you're going to Crime Con, DM us on Twitter and maybe we can. Meet we'll up sneak, for a drink. Yeah. I was going to say, we'll sneak you pictures. Yeah. If you can't be there. Yeah. We'll post pictures on our Instagram. We'll have a good time. You'll have a good time via Instagram through us. Mm -hmm. We do have a Patreon in case you guys are interested in doing that. No biggie if not. We also have our True Crime Podcast store on Etsy if you want some shirts. Got some tanks. Got some t-shirts. <laughs> Does anybody wear TikTok anymore? I don't know. Some. I don't know. To work out maybe. Okay. I don't know. 
Okay. All right, that's it. That's all I got. Hey, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Oh, bye-bye. Love ya. And here's to you, Mr. Robinson. At his office and demanded that his daughter. That his, his daughter? <clears throat> his daughter and the water. Daughter and the water. I'm just going to do that something again. Mr. Godfrey returned home and immediately confronted. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Godfrey, a private boys school for aspiring priest. A private? Private boys. Private. Private. What did I say? Private. 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 That's how I say it. You got a problem with it? Okay. Private. Private. I've always said private. Hmm. Okay. Good. Now, Beverly gives Robinson a job in the library. Not a handy. <clears throat> Not that kind of job, is it? <sighs> oh, my God. Stop it. Stop it. Or a blow? Shut up. Okay. Sorry, Nico. God, he's so young. He doesn't even know what that means. <laughs> Sorry, Nico. Which, of course, causes... Are you saying library? <sighs> no, seriously. Are you? Library. Okay. Library. It sounds like you're I saying... I might have been saying it to... Because I make fun of it all the time. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I you know. might have I'm going to say that whole little paragraph over because the hand job and blow job and... Although I was watching the show last night. Sorry, Nico. It was really funny. And it was, um, oh, it's so good. You got to watch it. It's on Netflix. It's called 50-50 with um, Seth Rogen, who I love, and Jordan Levitt. Which, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. One of them's dying of cancer. Yeah, but I've the seen one. that. Did you see it? And when you yeah, <laughs> It's an old movie. Yeah, it's a couple of years old, right? Mm -hmm. To a duplex in Kansas City. Wow. <laughs> Moving on down. Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Robinson. To the Midwest.